Welcome to the New York Presbyterian Hospital Wall Cornell Medical Center Kidney and Pancreas Transplant Program. Today we'll introduce you to our transplant program and review the basics that you need to know about transplantation. You will find detailed written materials in the packet you received earlier today. The information we're about to review is covered in those materials, so please do not feel you have to take detailed notes during this presentation. Please write down any questions that arise as you're watching, and your transplant coordinator will answer them later today. This presentation is also available on our website for you to view at any time. Thank you for your attendance. We hope you find this presentation interesting and informative. So who is eligible for a kidney transplant? A kidney transplant is recommended for people who have serious kidney dysfunction and will not be able to live without dialysis or a transplant. Some of the most common kidney diseases for which transplants are done include diabetes, high blood pressure, polycystic kidney disease, and glomerular diseases, which affect the part of the kidney that filters the blood. The degree of kidney failure that a person has can be determined by an equation that calculates the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. This number gives us an idea of how much kidney function remains and helps to guide your placement on the waiting list and or scheduling of a living donor kidney transplant. As you can see in the graphic, in the yellow section, People with moderate to severe kidney disease have a GFR between 15 and 60. In the red section, patients with kidney failure have a GFR of 15 or less. Patients usually require dialysis when their GFR reaches 10 to 15. However, patients can be listed for transplant once the GFR reaches 20 or less. This enables us to perform what we call a preemptive kidney transplantation, which means getting a transplant before needing dialysis. This is an important option since it is well known that people who receive a kidney transplant before needing dialysis do better after their transplant. In order to be eligible for kidney transplantation, you must be healthy enough to undergo major surgery, which requires general anesthesia. Because of this, people who need a transplant should not have severe problems with their heart or lungs. Because of the medications used to prevent rejection of the transplant, patients cannot have current or recent cancer, although there are a few exceptions. Patients must also have a good track record in attending dialysis and taking their medications since adherence before transplant often predicts a patient's adherence with the medications and follow-up required after the transplant. Patients must have sufficient insurance coverage to cover the transplant medications and other follow-up costs, since these can be expensive. When coming forward for transplant, you may hear the term compatibility used quite often. This term simply means that we will be determining if a potential donor may be a suitable donor for you. Several tests will be performed to assess your compatibility with your potential donor. We assess compatibility in terms of blood type, HLA, and crossmatch. We'll begin by talking about blood type compatibility. When looking at blood type, we use the same rules that are used for blood transfusion compatibility. For example, a person with type A blood can receive a kidney from a donor with type A or O blood. As you can see from the column on the right, a donor with blood type O can donate to any blood type, which is why O donors are called universal donors. Conversely, a recipient with type AB blood can receive from any blood type, making them universal recipients. HLA or antigen matching. Antigens are unique markers on the surface of our cells that we inherit from our parents and which help our immune system to recognize foreign cells, such as those from a transplanted organ. There are six antigens that we try to match in transplantation. Although matching can be important, for example, a six out of six match is known to do better than other matches, 
it is not critical to the success of transplantation. In fact, many transplants that we perform have a zero out of six match and the recipients do well. So when you receive your match results, remember that the match is not a critical factor in determining your compatibility. The last step in assessing compatibility is to perform a cross-match. A cross-match is a test where the blood of the recipient and the donor are mixed together to see if there is a reaction. We want you to have a negative cross-match, which means there was no reaction. If there is a reaction, it's called a positive cross-match, and it means that you, the recipient, has developed antibodies against the donor's antigens. Antibodies develop when people are exposed to antigens, or the genetic material of other people, through blood transfusions, prior transplants, and pregnancy. When antibodies are present, it does not mean that the transplant cannot occur. It just means we have to see how strong the reaction is, and then we can see what the options are. Now that we covered compatibility, let's discuss in more detail the types of living donors. Family members or individuals who are unrelated can donate one of their kidneys to someone who is in need of a kidney transplant. This type of transplant is called a living donor transplant. The first type of living donor is called a living related donor. This means the donor is a blood relative of the person needing the transplant, such as a parent, an adult child, or a sibling. The second type is a living unrelated donor who are people you have a relationship with outside of blood relatives. This can be a spouse or partner, friend, neighbor, coworker, or other acquaintance. The third type of living donor is an altruistic donor who are people who want to donate a kidney but do not have a specific person to donate to. These donors, also called non-directed or Good Samaritan donors, are often matched up with people who do not have a donor or who have a willing but incompatible donor. For those of you who have one or more people who are interested in being tested as a potential kidney donor for you, the first step is for them to contact the living donor team to express their interest in donating and register at cornell.donorscreen.org. If they pass the initial screening, they will come to the clinic for an initial evaluation visit. It requires a full day of meeting with a coordinator, assessing the donor's medical history, and answering any questions they have about donation. They will also be required to give samples of their blood in order to check blood type and cross-match compatibility. The living donor evaluation process is explained in more detail in a separate video. There are a few options available when there is a blood type or cross-match incompatibility between a donor and recipient. As you will see in the next slide, there are many patients who have willing but incompatible donors who cannot donate directly to them. Kidney pair donation or kidney exchange is a great option for these donor-recipient pairs. It is fairly common to have potential donors who aren't compatible, since one out of three will be blood type incompatible and one out of 10 will be cross-match incompatible due to antibodies against the donor. When a donor and recipient pair are not compatible, they can consider joining a registry of other incompatible pairs. Within these registries, computers are used to match compatible donors with recipients. This is known as kidney pair donation, or KPD. The graphic at the bottom shows how people develop antibodies against other people, namely blood transfusions, pregnancy, and prior transplant. Antibodies may increase the risk of developing rejection episodes, which in turn can shorten the lifespan of the transplanted organ. This graphic demonstrates the first KPD chain performed at our center in 2008. Three sets of transplant candidates and their willing but incompatible donors were able to receive a transplant and donate a kidney by the addition of an altruistic donor, as seen on the top right of the graphic, to start the chain. The altruistic donor donated to the wife of the first pair, 
whose husband then donated to the wife of the second pair. Her husband then donated to the five-year-old boy of the third pair, whose father later went on to kick off another transplant chain at a later date similar to how the altruistic donor kicked off this chain. There are many benefits to receiving a transplant through KPD. First and foremost, it allows the transplant candidate to receive a living donor transplant, which is a higher quality and longer lasting transplant on average compared to a deceased donor transplant. As seen in the graphic on the right, Living donor kidneys last more than 10 years longer than deceased donor kidneys on average. It also enables people to get a transplant faster, often even before needing dialysis, which also improves outcomes. Pairs who are compatible in the traditional blood type and cross-match sense also choose to participate in KPD. They do so in order to try to receive a better age or genetic match or if they have low levels of antibody against their donor and want to try to find a donor with whom they have less or no antibodies against. Lastly, we partner with the National Kidney Registry, which works with over 70 transplant centers in the U.S. Because of this, there is a larger pool of donor transplant candidate pairs, which makes it easier to find matches and lead to more transplants. As shown in the graphic of our first KPD transplant chain, altruistic donors play a vital role. These altruistic or non-directed or Good Samaritan donors wish to give a kidney but have no intended recipient. This provides additional blood type O donors into the pool. Altruistic donors tend to kick off kidney pair donation transplant chains. Advanced donation is a kidney-paired exchange separated in time. A donor may donate in advance of their intended recipient getting a transplant. For example, if the donor needs to serve as a caregiver for the patient once they get a transplant. The following scenario is an example of advanced donation due to rigid time restrictions. A 36-year-old son wanted to donate to his mother but had a short donation window due to his limited leave from the Navy. He needed to complete his recovery in order to resume deployment. Using the advanced donation program, the son was able to donate within his leave window before his mother, who's the recipient, was fully worked up and cleared for a transplant. The mother received a match from a 27-year-old donor and was transplanted five months after the son, who's the advanced donation donor, donated. Since the son was an O blood type, five subsequent transplants were facilitated. Advanced donation may also occur in anticipation of a loved one needing a kidney transplant in the future. The loved one then receives a voucher for a living donor kidney in case they need a transplant in the future. The following example illustrates a voucher scenario. In 2007, when she was 10, a girl underwent a kidney transplant from a living donor. Nine years later, her graft function remained excellent, but her 52-year-old father wanted to donate a backup kidney in case his daughter's allograft eventually failed. The father welcomed the use of the voucher because he wanted to make his donation while he was young and healthy enough to do so. In August 2015, at New York Presbyterian Wall Cornell Medical Center, the father donated a kidney, triggering a chain of eight transplants and assuring that if his daughter needs a second allograft in the future, she will be prioritized for a living donor from the end of a future KPD chain. There are a few additional options available when there is a blood type or cross-match incompatibility between a donor and recipient. For a positive cross-match, there are medications and a treatment called plasmapheresis, which can decrease the amount of antibodies in the candidate to allow the transplant to occur. 
For certain combinations of blood types, the incompatibility can be reduced by treating the person who needs the transplant with a treatment similar to what is described above for positive cross-match transplants, and the transplant may be able to go forward. If these treatments fail to reduce antibody levels sufficiently, patients do have the option to wait for a deceased donor transplant. There are several steps that you must take in order to be added to the transplant waiting list. During today's visit, you went through registration, where we collect important information from you and give you a packet of materials about transplantation. During the course of the evaluation process, you will meet with two doctors, a kidney doctor and a transplant surgeon. These doctors will evaluate your health and suitability for transplantation. You will also meet with a social worker who will address your support system, any mental health or substance abuse issues, as well as insurance and financial aspects of transplantation. Your transplant coordinator is your main contact throughout the process as they coordinate not only your transplant evaluation, but also maintain your status on the waiting list. A financial coordinator will also review your insurance and financial situation and counsel you about costs associated with transplantation. Finally, you may be seen by a dietitian if it is determined that you could benefit from a nutritional consultation. Your attendance at this educational session is also an important part of this evaluation visit. There is a comprehensive panel of blood tests that are performed prior to determining your suitability for transplant. These include both standard laboratory tests as well as tests to determine blood type and cross-match compatibility. The standard tests include blood chemistry and hematology, as well as tests to look for infections such as HIV, hepatitis B and C, and tuberculosis. All patients will need a chest x-ray and an electrocardiogram, also called an EKG. Patients will also require either an abdominal ultrasound or CT scan. There will be other testing required based on your gender or age, such as mammograms, pap smears, PSA levels, or colonoscopy. In addition, your transplant coordinator will assist you in scheduling any other tests deemed necessary during your evaluation. Additional testing is based on your past medical history, family history, and or symptoms that you're experiencing. Examples of this may include visits with physicians who specialize in diseases of the heart, liver, lungs, blood, or blood vessels, or mental health. Once all of your required testing is complete and we have received the results, the transplant team will meet to review your case and determine whether or not you're a suitable candidate for transplantation. If you are a suitable candidate, you'll be added to the national waiting list, which is maintained by UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing. You will receive a letter in the mail outlining your status and outlining your responsibilities as a transplant candidate. If you are unable to find a living donor, you will need to wait on the national waiting list for your kidney. There are currently more than 100,000 patients waiting for a kidney transplant in the United States. Over 20,000 kidney transplants are performed each year. More than 3,800 kidney transplant candidates died in 2018 while on the wait list. On the right, you can see the so-called transplant regions that the U.S. is broken up into. We are in Region 9, which is geographically small but densely populated. You do have the option to list at more than one region, as other regions may have shorter waiting times. In the next few slides, we will describe your options to receive different types of deceased donor transplants that may shorten your waiting time. But remember, don't give up on trying to find a living donor. We have many tools available to help you in your search. Even if a patient needing a transplant has potential living donors, 
all patients are placed on the transplant waiting list for a deceased donor kidney. This type of transplant is from someone who has died and has donated their organs. In general, kidneys from living donors last longer than those from deceased donors. However, many deceased donors provide transplant kidneys that can go on to function for 10 to 15 years. In this slide, we'll talk about some special cases of higher risk deceased donors. Please keep in mind that the decision to use these types of organs are made on a case-by-case -case basis, carefully balancing the risks and benefits. Our own center-specific results using these types of organs have been excellent, so we continue to offer these types of organs as a valuable resource that can help shorten waiting time for a deceased donor transplant. Some organs are older and may have had medical conditions such as diabetes or high blood pressure, giving them a higher KDPI score, which gives a sense of how long a transplanted organ may last. For donors with the highest KDPI scores, defined as 86 to 100%, patients must give their consent to be willing to consider such organs. Organs from pediatric donors can also be used for transplantation. Depending on the size of the organs, patients receiving a transplant from a pediatric donor may receive one kidney or, more rarely, might receive both kidneys. Although these organs are smaller because they are from children, they do grow over time after the transplant, usually reaching adult size. Public Health Service Increased Risk, or PHS donors, are donors who have risk factors for infections such as HIV or hepatitis C. The risk is due to donor behaviors such as high-risk sexual activities or IV drug abuse. Although we test all donors for these types of infections, there is a small chance that the infection is too recent to be detected with standard tests. Again, all of these donors are considered on a case-by-case -case basis. When we offer kidneys from PHS donors, the potential recipient is informed of the risks and must agree to receive that organ. They have the right to refuse without penalty. The graphic shows the risk of contracting HIV or hepatitis C from an increased risk donor, which is 0.4 out of 100, compared to lifetime risk of death in a traffic accident, which is 0.9 out of 100, or annual risk of death while waiting for a kidney, which is 9 out of 100. As you can see, risk of contracting an infection is very low in comparison. An additional option for transplant candidates to consider is to sign up to receive an organ from a donor who is hepatitis C virus, or HCV, antibody positive, but does not have active HCV infection, called non-viremic. This occurs in the following situations. The donor had HCV infection, but it was spontaneously cleared by their immune system. The donor had HCV infection, but received medication treatment and was cured. The antibody test was a false positive result. The HCV RNA test, which measures active HCV, was a false negative result. The exact risk of transmission of active HCV is unknown. It appears extremely low, may develop a positive HCV antibody test without developing active viremic HCV. The risk of developing active viremic HCV would be highest when receiving an organ with other risk factors for HCV, such as PHS, increased risk donor organs. There is a very small risk, about 0.1%, or 1 in 1,000, that the donor developed the HCV infection too recently to be detected by standard tests for viremia. 
Up until recently, donors with hepatitis C were only considered for recipients who had actively replicating hepatitis C themselves. Now, patients without hepatitis C may consider consenting to receive a hepatitis C positive kidney since hepatitis C can now be cured. What is hepatitis C? Hepatitis C is a virus that infects the liver. Hepatitis C virus is spread through the blood, such as through blood transfusions, needle sticks, tattoos, and IV drugs. Unlike other viruses that infect the liver, such as hepatitis A, hepatitis B, etc., most patients who are exposed to hepatitis C virus develop chronic infection and need to take medications to cure the virus. About 3 million people in the United States have hepatitis C virus, which is about 2% of the population. 50 to 75% of Americans with hepatitis C virus are unaware of their infection. The national rate of new cases of hepatitis C virus has increased each year from 2010 to 2014. During this period, there has been a 158.1% increase in the number of new cases reported. What happens to the liver when you have hepatitis C? In the short term, an acute infection. Symptoms are feeling tired, having a fever, stomach pain, and vomiting. Very rarely, it can lead to liver failure. Patients who have had a transplant. Most patients are asymptomatic, although liver tests may be elevated. There is a very rare special type of hepatitis C infection that occurs in a small number of transplant patients that causes yellow skin and liver swelling. In the long term, progressive liver scarring may occur, leading to cirrhosis. Cirrhosis occurs over 15 to 30 years in about 20% of patients in the general population without a transplant. Cirrhosis occurs more quickly after a transplant due to the anti-rejection medications if the HCV is untreated. Cirrhosis can lead to liver failure, liver cancer, or death if it is not treated. Early treatment of hepatitis C helps to avoid long-term complications like cirrhosis. Hepatitis C is now curable in most people, greater than 95% of people, using first-line treatments. Most treatments require one to three pills once a day for two or three months. These medications have few side effects. There are additional treatments available to treat the small number of patients who are not cured with the first-line treatment. These medications have also been tested and are effective after kidney transplant. Medications are started early after transplant to prevent scarring and liver damage. Close monitoring will occur in conjunction with standard post-transplant visits. This graphic shows an example of one of the medications used to treat hepatitis C. There is an increase in the number of organs with hepatitis C that are available from deceased donors, many from young, otherwise very healthy donors. This is partially due to the opioid epidemic. In the past, these organs would be discarded. Now they are being used for transplant. In 2017, 388 kidneys from donors with hepatitis C were discarded. It started to be utilized in the setting of research studies and has now progressed to use in clinical care. Participation is voluntary. If you agree to consider these organs, you will be eligible to receive organs both from donors with or without hepatitis C. So what are the risks if you decide to consider receiving an organ from a donor with active hepatitis C infection? There is likely a 100% chance of developing hepatitis C infection. This has been the experience to date. There is a small risk of developing severe hepatitis C infection, liver failure, need for liver transplant, or death. 
we cannot guarantee that the medication to treat hepatitis C will be partially or completely covered by your insurance. You will need to take universal precautions to prevent infecting others, such as with bleeding cuts or wounds, sexual intercourse, sharing personal care items where blood may be present. How does hepatitis C spread? Used or shared needles, syringes, or lancets. Through sex. Through sharing care items like toothbrushes or razors. Being born to a mother with hepatitis C. Medical mishaps like needle injuries or unsterile instruments. Hepatitis C does not spread through breastfeeding, sharing eating utensils, kissing, hugging, or holding hands, insect bites, coughing, or sneezing. Benefits include access to an expanded pool of organ donors. You may receive a kidney transplant faster from a donor with active hepatitis C. You may receive an organ from a younger, healthier donor. We know all of this information may be confusing. Your transplant coordinator will be discussing these options with you today and will answer any questions you may have. Now we are going to touch briefly on how transplant organs are distributed. In the United States, the United Network for Organ Sharing, or UNOS, is responsible for matching organs from deceased donors with people on the transplant waiting list. UNOS receives data from medical centers throughout the country regarding adults and children who need organ transplants. The transplant center that follows you is responsible for sending the data to UNOS and updating them as your condition changes. The kidney allocation system uses a computer algorithm to calculate the optimal match between a deceased donor and a potential recipient. It factors in scores that measure the deceased donor and the potential recipient, which will be described next. We'll start by talking about the score given to a deceased donor. Deceased donor kidneys are given a Kidney Donor Profile Index, or KDPI score. This is a score of 0 to 100% based on how long the kidney is expected to last. The lower the score, the better the expected function. For example, donor kidneys with a KDPI of 20% are expected to work longer than 80% of other donor kidneys. Because kidneys with a KDPI score above 85% are expected to function for a shorter time than kidneys with a lower KDPI score, Patients must provide their consent to be willing to consider a kidney from a donor with a KDPI score of 86% and above. You may have heard of kidneys being classified as standard criteria or expanded criteria. This terminology is no longer being used in the current allocation system. A KDPI score above 85% is now used in place of the former expanded criteria donor classification. Transplant candidates will receive an estimated post-transplant survival score, or an EPTS score. This score also ranges from 0 to 100 percent based on how long the candidate will need a functioning kidney transplant compared to other candidates. A person with an EPTS score of 20 percent is likely to need a kidney longer than 80 percent of other candidates. As a review, KDPI score calculates donor risk. EPTS score calculates recipient risk. The lower the KDPI score, the more likely the donor kidney will last longer. The lower the EPTS score, the more likely a candidate will receive a lower KDPI kidney. When a potential organ becomes available, you will receive a phone call from a transplant coordinator who will make sure you are willing and able to come in for the transplant and are well enough to do so. The transplant coordinator will provide you with important information such as when you need to stop eating and drinking in preparation for the surgery and when you should come into the hospital. Keep in mind that being admitted to the hospital does not guarantee that you will receive a transplant. 
it is possible that the organ could go to someone higher up on the list at another center, or you could have a positive cross-match against the donor, which would prevent the transplant from occurring. Communication with your transplant coordinator is key to your success in receiving a transplant. Every month, your dialysis unit should draw a blood sample and send it to our transplant lab. It is essential that we receive the blood samples because they are used to run cross-matches with potential donors that become available. It is essential that you keep your transplant coordinator up to date. This includes changes to your contact information and telling us when you're on vacation. We need to know how to reach you when a kidney becomes available. You must also let your transplant coordinator know of any significant changes to your medical condition. For example, if you have a heart attack, undergo major surgery, are hospitalized for an infection, or are diagnosed with cancer, these are important events that you must inform us of. Any changes to your health insurance must also be reported to us immediately as we will need to reassess your ability to afford transplantation. You should also be aware of your right to list in multiple transplant centers and to transfer your waiting time. For multi-listing, you have the right to be listed at transplant centers in multiple geographic locations. It is not beneficial to list in more than one local center since we share the same pool of donor organs. If you are already listed for transplantation, you have the right to transfer that waiting time to another transplant center if you choose to. When transferring your waiting time, you do not lose any of the time you have already accumulated. If all goes well and you are designated to receive the transplant, you will either be scheduled for a living donor transplant surgery or be placed on the waiting list for a deceased donor transplant surgery. Let's talk about the process that occurs when you arrive to the hospital for your transplant surgery. When you are admitted to the hospital, you will have preoperative testing, including blood draws for laboratory tests, an electrocardiogram to check your heart, and a chest x-ray. You will be seen by several members of the transplant team who will make sure you are still healthy enough to undergo the transplant. Once it is confirmed that the transplant will proceed, you will receive several medications shortly before you are transferred to the operating room. The operation itself will take about two to four hours. It is performed under general anesthesia and you will spend several hours in the recovery room after the surgery. As you can see from the diagram, the transplant kidney does not replace your old kidneys. The transplanted kidney is placed through a five to six inch incision in the lower abdomen on the front side of the body. Kidney transplant recipients are generally in the hospital for four to six days. During the hospital stay, you will have several intravenous lines so that we can administer medications and fluids. You will also have a Foley catheter for about four days. The purpose of this Foley catheter is to allow the urine to continuously drain from your body, giving your bladder some time to heal from the surgery. This also helps us measure the amount of urine you're making, which tells us how well your kidney is working. In the first day after your surgery, your diet will be advanced to a clear liquid diet and then solid food as long as you're tolerating it. You will need to get out of bed and walk on the first day. This helps to speed your recovery and prevent complications such as blood clots and pneumonia. You will learn about your medications and other important facts about how to care for yourself and your new transplant during various educational sessions while you are hospitalized. If you're considering transplantation, it is very important that you understand the risks associated with receiving a transplant. Please do not hesitate to ask questions if you do not understand some of the risks or if you would like more information. In terms of the transplant surgery itself, the risks are similar to any operation that requires general anesthesia. 
The main risks include pain from the operation, bleeding, blood clots, reaction to the anesthesia, and infections such as pneumonia or wound infection. For patients receiving a deceased donor kidney, there's a 30 to 40% chance that the kidney will not wake up right away. This is called delayed graft function. If this occurs, you will require dialysis until the kidney wakes up. Although it is rare, sometimes the kidney never wakes up. In this case, you will require dialysis and may go back on the list to wait for another transplant. In cases like this, you will get all of your waiting time back. Kidney transplant recipients sometimes develop depression or anxiety after their transplant. The medications we use to protect against rejection have short and long-term side effects. Each of the medications has a unique set of side effects that you will learn more about after your transplant. Because these medications affect the immune system, whose normal job is to protect us from infection and cancer, risks of these medications include infection and cancer. We try to avoid these complications by tailoring each patient's medication regimen to provide an amount of immunosuppression that is effective yet minimizes side effects. Changes to insurance policies or jobs require careful consideration since the medications and follow-up care are expensive. Your recovery period may affect your finances due to increased childcare costs, transportation costs, and lost wages. If you experience any change in your insurance coverage or job status after transplant, your medical care may be compromised. Therefore, it is critical to discuss all potential issues with your social worker. It is also very important to understand that transplanted organs do not last forever, and repeat transplantation is often necessary, particularly for people whose first transplant occurred at a younger age. Therefore, it is very important to stick to your medication and follow-up regimen to take care of your transplant so you could keep it working for as long as possible. Now that we reviewed the risks of transplantation, let's take a look at the benefits. Kidney transplantation is associated with a big improvement in quality of life compared to remaining on dialysis. This is due to freedom from dialysis treatments, a less restricted diet once the kidney is functioning well, and an overall improved sense of well-being. Transplant recipients often comment about feeling better very quickly after the transplant, even though they just had surgery. A very important benefit is that patient survival is much improved after a kidney transplant as compared to remaining on dialysis. There is only one alternative to kidney transplantation, which is to remain on dialysis. Most patients will go home after transplant taking medications only twice a day, approximately 12 hours apart. We do our best to keep your medication regimen as simple and straightforward as possible. We will provide you with a list of your medications, complete with pictures and a chart on how many pills to take and at what time. We will also fill your pill box for you before you leave the hospital in order to give you a smooth transition from the hospital to your home. There are several types of medications that you need after having a transplant. The first type are called immunosuppressants or anti-rejection medications, which suppress your immune system. These are used to protect the transplanted organ from being rejected. Here at Cornell, we have a less is more approach with immunosuppression. We tailor to the needs of the individual patient by minimizing the amount of medications you need in order to prevent rejection while also minimizing side effects. At the time of transplantation, you will receive several medications through an IV, a tube that goes into your bloodstream. These medications are called induction immunosuppression because they provide a higher level of protection against rejection surrounding the time of transplant. You will also start taking oral medications to suppress your immune system. 
These medications are called maintenance immunosuppressants because you will continue to take them for as long as your transplant continues to function. Most patients will take and go home on the two maintenance immunosuppressants listed on this slide. Tacrolimus, also known as Prograf, and mycophenolate, also known as Celsept. Some patients will also need to go home on prednisone, those who are already taken prednisone or those who have a higher risk of transplant rejection. Because you'll be taking medications that suppress your immune system, you may be more susceptible to infections after your transplant. In order to protect you from infections that are well known to occur after transplant, we give you several medications that prevent infection. The first is called sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim, or Bactrim, which protects you against bacterial infection. It is taken for one year after your transplant. Next is Valgencyclovir, or Valcite, which helps to prevent viral infection. This is taken for six months after your transplant. Last is Clotrimazole, or Mycelex, which protects against fungal infection and is taken for three months after your transplant. The last group of medications you will take help to prevent some of the side effects of the other medications. There is a medication to prevent constipation and a blood pressure medication that has beneficial effects on your kidney function. We will also tell you which, if any, of your pre-transplant medications need to be continued after transplant. These are often medications used to treat high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or diabetes. After you are discharged from the hospital, you should expect to come back to the transplant clinic for follow-up visits. For the first month, you will need to visit us twice a week or potentially more often if you have any complications. Then, for the next two months, you will visit us once a week. About two to three months after your transplant surgery, you may return to the care of your local kidney doctor. However, you will also need to return to us for visits periodically. It is important to return to our center periodically so we can help you to maintain your transplant for as long as possible. In general, transplant recipients can return to work about two to three months after their transplant as long as they are doing well. Now that we discussed the transplant process, we want to give you a background of our transplant program. The New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Kidney and Pancreas Transplant Program is the oldest transplant program in New York City, having performed New York's first kidney transplant in 1963. We are a Medicare-approved transplant center, one of the most experienced and advanced programs in the United States. As seen on the graphic on the right, we performed around 200 living and deceased donor kidney transplants each year since 2006. We have the largest living donor kidney program on the East Coast and within the top three in the country. The mission of our transplant program is to maximize opportunities for transplantation for all of our patients. If there is a way to safely transplant you, we will find it. Our transplant program has excellent patient and graft survival rates compared to expected outcomes. Expected outcomes are calculated by the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients, or SRTR, based on the mix of recipient and donor characteristics at our center compared to similar patients' experience at centers throughout the country. Notably, our excellent outcomes have occurred in the setting of high transplant volumes in a diverse and often complicated patient population. We are incredibly proud of our program's record of success and believe these results are a direct result of our dedication to providing the best patient care possible. As mentioned, national transplant outcomes are reported every six months by the SRTR. The SRTR calculates the patient and transplant survival rates that is expected based on national results for a specific transplant center based on the complexity of both the patients and the type of donors that a program utilizes. 
the results at our transplant center have been consistently similar to expected. The most recent outcomes published by the SRTR about our transplant program can be found in the back of your handout as well as in one of the consent documents that your transplant coordinator will be reviewing with you later today. Please let us know if you have any questions about this information and how it compares to other local transplant centers. For more information, please visit the SRTR website at www.srtr.org. The SRTR reports contain a lot of information and can be overwhelming to interpret. However, the basic information that transplant candidates find useful include patient and transplant survival rates, waiting times, and transplant rates by blood type. This information is summarized at the back of your handout. We would like to highlight a few other points about our transplant program. Our program consists of a dedicated, experienced group of professionals with many years in the field of transplantation that cares for a large group of transplant patients. This large group of patients is very diverse, all ages from the very young to the elderly, all races, and patients of varying medical conditions besides their kidney disease. We have been able to personalize and minimize the immunosuppression regimen of our patients and have over a 15-year history of cutting-edge immune therapy with the steroid-free maintenance immunosuppression regimen. Our transplant program is housed within New York Presbyterian, consistently the number one hospital in New York and among the top five centers for kidney disease in the United States, as reported by U.S. News and World Report. In addition, we have a very active research program in both the research lab and at the bedside. Some of the most exciting research surrounds development of a non-invasive monitoring test for rejection that may someday replace the need for a kidney biopsy. We also have one of the largest experience with kidney pair donation, which enables transplantation for patients who might otherwise wait a long time on the kidney waiting list for a deceased donor kidney transplant. Also in the arena of living donation, our donor surgeon has the largest national experience with single-site surgery for removing the donor's kidney, which uses just one incision around the belly button to perform the laparoscopic surgery and remove the kidney. Now we'd like to go over the education packet you received, entitled Kidney and Pancreas Transplant Program, Information for Patients. What you need to know about kidney and pancreas transplantation at NYP while Cornell. There are five sections in this packet, and each section is labeled by tabs on the right. When you first open up the packet, you'll find several forms that you'll need to read, complete, and sign at today's visit. The second section is labeled for today's visit. In this section, you'll find a printout of this presentation, including SRTR data on our center's outcomes and waiting times, and consent forms, which your transplant coordinator will review with you today. The third section is labeled NYP Cornell Literature. In this section, you'll find information for transplant candidates, dialysis access services, and information about financial preparation for transplantation. You'll also find information about our current transplant research and our most recent newsletter. The fourth section is labeled About Living Donation. In this section, you'll find information about kidney paired donation or paired exchange. You'll also see a booklet for living kidney donors, which explains the living donation process. On the right-hand side of this section, you'll see how you can find a kidney champion, someone who is willing to educate others about your condition and about your transplant options. We know it isn't easy for a person with kidney failure to ask others if they are willing to consider being a kidney donor. Having a kidney champion not only alleviates some of that burden, 
but also helps you get the word out and we've developed some tools for kidney champions to use to help you do this. You'll also find information about the National Living Donor Assistance Center or NLDAC. This program provides financial assistance to those who want to donate an organ. Although the recipients Medicare or private health insurance pays for the donor's visits, including lab tests, surgery, and post-op care, there are other financial expenses associated with living donation, such as lost wages, travel expenses, and follow-up care. The NLDAC can be an invaluable resource for reimbursement of these expenses. The final section is labeled UNOS Literature. This is information provided by the United Network for Organ Sharing. In this section, you'll find answers to frequently asked questions about kidney allocation, multiple listing and waiting time transfer, and pancreas transplantation. There is also contact information for general transplant-related questions. Thank you for your attention to this important educational program. We hope you found it to be informative and useful in your decision to pursue transplantation. Please direct any questions to your transplant coordinator or other team members that you meet today. Please visit the Weill Cornell Kidney and Pancreas Transplant YouTube channel anytime to watch this and other videos and to access additional educational content.